Good morning. So we are going to do inventory valuation. Okay, and inventory, another word for inventory is stock. So the tangible stock that a business will buy to sell and make a profit, that is what we are going to be dealing with. And we are going to be talking about how we value the stock. You know, if you buy, let's say, a consignment of baked beans and you buy it at a certain price, but throughout the year, you are buying your baked beans at different prices. How do you value your closing stock at the end of the year? And this is what we are going to be addressing. It is a real practical session. It is, you can just try and think of a, a supermarket, let's say, and you think about the the number of items they have and when they take a stock at the end of the year, how do they value that stock? But before we get into that, in grade 11, you should have been exposed to stock systems, which is two stock systems, which is the periodic stock system and the perpetual stock system. Okay, so there are two stock systems that businesses also adhere to. Perpetual is might be a new word to you, but it's something that you've been doing since grade eight. You have actually been doing the perpetual stock system where you buy a, an item, it gets taken in into the trading stock account, and when you sell an item, the cost of that item is then entered into the cost of sales account. So that is what you have been exposed to all the while. So in the perpetual stock system, stock is purchased and recorded as an asset, okay? Because your trading stock account is an asset. So when you buy your stock, you record it and hold it in your books for the whole year as an asset. Cost of sales is calculated at the point of sale. What does that mean? Immediately when you sell your item, there's a value attached to the cost of that item. So cost of sales is updated and the cost of sales account is then debited. In the periodic stock system, okay, so periodic means it's not ongoing, perpetual means ongoing, periodic means at the end of each period, at the end of each, let's say it can be at the end of the financial year, or it can be at the end of a specific uh, number of months, but it's periodic. Stock that is purchased is entered as an expense or recorded as an expense and is entered into the purchaser's account. Now that is very different from the perpetual, okay? So just remember, in periodic, stock is an expense and entered in the purchaser's account and your cost of sales is calculated at the end of the financial year. So you don't have a running balance of your cost of sales. Now, why is that important to mention? It's important to mention because we are busy with stock valuation. At the end of the year, you have to have a value for trading stock that goes into your balance sheet. And we, at the end of the year, we value that trading stock, okay? And that is where we are heading in this session. I just want to pause to ask if there are any questions, if you would like me to explain the perpetual and periodic. But for now, this is all you need to know. And as we go along, I will keep referring to these two stock systems. Are there any questions, teachers, in the classroom? Okay, if there are no questions, that is absolutely fine. I will then move on. So, let's look at our valuation methods of stock, okay? There are three ways that a business can value their stock. Now, these are terms that you, mu you must know because your teacher would have done this with you in term two. The first method is the FIFO method, the first in, first out method. And there, we assume that stock that is bought first is sold first, okay? And what is left all over is what we bought last. That's the FIFO method. That's the first method or one of the three methods of stock valuation. The second one is weighted average. We use a weighted average to calculate stock on hand or closing stock. 
And the third one is specific identification. Now, a business will choose one of the three, okay, to value their stock. And there's different reasons why a business will choose um, the different methods. For instance, the first in, first out method is generally used when a business sells huge items. If you think of cars, okay, let's think of a car. A business is more likely to know what the um, the what was bought first and what was sold first. So that makes sense that when it, when it comes to cars and bigger items that they would use the FIFO method, okay? Also, stock with a limited shelf life, like for instance, milk. It makes sense. If I buy in a consignment of milk, there's a sell-by date, so I'm going to sell it first, okay? Computers and TVs and those bigger items, it makes sense to use FIFO. Then weighted average. If you think of pick and pay and the baked beans that, are, that they buy, and, and that's the example I'm going to use because it's the for me it's just the best example to use. They buy cans and cans and cans of baked beans, but they're not going to count every ton of baked beans and assign a cost to it. And each time they buy the baked beans, they might buy it at different prices. So they will use a weighted average and so the weighted average is used for smaller items okay um, and then generally it, it is identical items that we use the weighted average for and so that is the weighted average and in specific identification i'm going to use the example of cars again because there you can use that same example i buy in five cars and i sell three of the cars so i know what the cost price of the two cars are that's left over so we are going to work through each of this in the two hours and we are going to look at the activities that your teacher printed out for you, and we are going to um, approach it that way. So that is the I do for now. Are there any questions with regards to the three methods that I just spoke about? Miss um, Moise, there's no yes. questions in the okay. chat at this stage. Okay, thank you so much, ma'am. So these cost calculations are used to determine closing stock. Okay, it's only used to determine closing stock. And if you can kind of in your brain separate what they're asking for, right? They're asking for closing stock. Which method are they using? They're using FIFO or weighted average or specific identification. Now, when it comes to this section of work, there's really, yeah, there are more than three questions, but when it comes to the calculations, there's basically three questions that they ask you. The one is to calculate the value of closing stock using either FIFO, weighted average, or specific identification. So remember I said to you, it's only when we calculate closing stock that we use one of the methods. The second question they'll ask you is calculate cost of sales, and the third question they'll ask you is calculate gross profit. The nice thing about this is you only use the methods when you're calculating closing stock. When you calculate cost of sales, you use the same calculation. And we, when you um, calculate gross profit, you use the same calculation. So if you understand that this work is actually just about three questions and you separate those three questions in your brain, then this work will not be that confusing. Okay, so before we dive into FIFO, remember we are talking about the value of closing stock. The first thing you must ask yourself is what is the number of units left over? Because whether you are using FIFO, whether you are using weighted average, you have to know the number of units you, are, you have left over. And based on the number of units, you are going to assign a RAND value, and then you're going to calculate your RAND value of closing stock. Okay. The good thing is, learners, this amount is often given. So the first thing you do when you get this question, you read, calculate the value of closing stock, right? You know that that is the question. The second thing you ask yourself is, which method am I using? And based on the method, you will approach it differently. And the third thing you look for is 
the number of items left over. Okay, so if you are aware of those three things that you need to look for, then you start your question. So let's look at first in, first out. And remember I said to you, stock bought first will be sold first. So learners, it's still I do, and I'm not going to be doing for much longer because I'm going to introduce first in, first out, then you are going to do. So listen up because I'm going to do an example with you and then you are going to do activity one. You are going to do activity 1.2.1. Okay, so that's how we're going to approach this work. So there I have on the screen I have a schedule and this is basically the schedule that you would get. On the schedule they must tell you what the number of units are, the cost per unit and the total value. Then they're going to give you all sorts of information with regards to the units. On the first line I have my opening stock. I have six. So you also need to know what your opening stock is. Then I have purchases and the total number of items purchased was 27 for the month, okay? So I start out with six, and then I bought a total of 27 for the specific months or for the month of September. Then I returned two, so you have to be aware of your returns as well. But more specifically, the last line, it says there is there are 13 bicycles left over, okay? There are 13 bicycles left over. So I'm using the first in, first out method. So I need to know of the 13, right? What purchase is that applicable to? In other words, I bought on the 3rd of September and then I bought on the 25th of September, a total of 27. I have 13 left. So let's go through that. First thing I'm going to ask myself is number of units left over is 30. Now I need to bear that in mind. I cannot move forward if I don't know how many units I have left over. Okay, that's my number of units left over. I returned two of the 3rd of September purchase. They said I return to that I bought on the 3rd of September. Therefore, I only had 10 available there. So, I have 13 of the 15 left over. If my number of units left over is less than my last purchase, then I have that whole purchase, okay, I have 13 of that left over. I'm going to use three more examples to try and explain that to you. And then I am going to come back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so let me go over here. Ma'am Conradi, if you can tell me whether you can see what I've got on the screen now. I'm sharing my screen and I'm going to be writing. It is clear, Mandy. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So let's let's just go through because I find that learners struggle with this concept. OK, so first in, first out. OK, I have opening stock and these are my purchases for the various months. I have 700 left over. My 700 is less than my last purchase. So what I have left over is 700 of the last purchase obviously at the cost price, whatever that cost me, okay? If that was, if I bought 800 at 100 Rand, then that would be 700 at 100 Rand, okay? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't fill in this. I bought that at 150 and I bought that at 130 and that was bought at 120. What I'm trying to say is how do you spot the amount where that 700 comes from? That 700 comes entirely from my last purchase because my 700 is less than my last purchase. Let's use another example. Okay, same example, but now I have 900 left over. My 900 is more than my last purchase. Okay, 
So of the last purchase, I have the whole 800, and then I must have 100 of the next, of the previous purchase. So you work backwards. If that is more than my last purchase, I absorb my whole last purchase into it and a hundred of the previous purchase. Okay, let's do the last example. Then you are going to do. So now I have a thousand left over, but I have a thousand left over, but returns a hundred from the March purchase. So I bought 800, but I returned 100. Therefore, effectively, I only had 700 to sell. So therefore, that is more than my last purchase. So the whole 700 is left over and 300 of my previous purchase. Because the 7 plus the 3 must equal 1,000. Okay? There, I'm going to look at this one. The 8 plus the 1 that's left over of that purchase must equal 900. Okay. So let me just get back to my PowerPoint and finish off the I do. Then you are going to do. Did all of that. So how do we then calculate the value of closing stock. There are 13 items left over. The cost price that I bought the items for was 1,500. So therefore I take the 13 times the 1,5, which is the cost price of my last purchase to give me the value, the rand value of my closing stock. Let's just go back. Can you see that I bought 15 at 1,5, but I have 13 left of the 15, so it's 13 times 1, 5. Okay, so let's go over to you do. Please take out your workbooks and that is the question, question one. Okay, but we're not going to do, we're just going to focus on what I have explained now. Let me just see if I can make that bigger. There we go. That's a bit bigger. Sorry, that's big. So if you can all go to your books, take out your, your answer book, you take out your question, and I've got the question in front of you on the screens. For now, we are not going to do 1.1, okay? Because I just explained FIFO for now. We'll get back to 1.1. We'll tie all of that up later, but I think we need to take this in small bites. Okay, take your pen in your hand, take your answer book or your pencil, your answer book and your question paper. And I'm going to read. It says, you are provided with the information relating to Mongi traders. The business sells one type of plastic table. The financial year ends on the 31st of December. The business uses the FIFO method. It's important to know which method you are using. And they use the periodic inventory or periodic stock system. Okay, it's important to know that. So when we go through the activity, we are going to now look at what are they asking for. Can you see, can I highlighted my three questions? Calculate the value of closing stock. That was question one. That's what we're going to do now. Then just for interest sake, I haven't spoken about cost of sales or gross profit, but there's question two and there's question three. So can you see, they say, calculate the value of closing stock using or according to the FIFO method. Okay, so pay in mind FIFO. What did I say? What is the first thing? Or well, after looking at the method that you are using, can you identify 
closing stock. I'm just going to help you with this and then I'm helping you know more. Okay, so there is the number of units left over, also known as number of units of closing stock. Okay, I'm just going to use closing stock. So that is a vital number to know. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to do FIFO. So you've got 440 left over. Now, you are going to do. So, there's my schedule. Okay, we know. I'm just going to write here, just to leave it there. There's 440 units left over. Here's all sorts of information here. Okay. There's number of units, there's cost per unit, there's carriage on purchases, there's all of those sorts of things here. Right, now I just want you to baby steps. Let's do baby steps. I want you to tell me or to break down the 440. I want you to break down the 440 for me. I want you to tell me how many units are left over at which cost price. I'm going to give you four minutes to do that. Four minutes. So you can discuss it with your friends. Your teacher can help you if you're not sure. But remember, you do now and then we will do in four minutes time. Okay, thank you, learners. So what I have here is, remember I said to you, just work out the number. We're going to look at the RAND value in a minute because this activity is just a bit more complicated um, than meets the eye. So 
we've got 440 left over. Okay, let's just turn our eye to the returns here. It says on the 5th of July, 50 units were returned and the units uh, cost 380 that was returned. These units were from the June purchase. Okay, these units were from the June purchase. Now let's see if that's going to affect our calculation here. Let's just see. I have 440 left over. My last purchase, oh sorry, number of units, my last purchase was 300. So the 440 is more than the 300. So I must have the whole 300 left over because the 440 is more. I can't absorb 440 into 300. There's going to be a spill over. Okay, if you think of a bucket, my bucket is only 300. It can only take 300 milliliters or 300 liters. Quite a big bucket then, eh? 300 liters, but I've got 440 liters. So the whole 300 liters is going to be filled up. So the whole 300 is going to be absorbed. Then I am going to need 140 from the 500 that I purchased there. That is also left over, 140. So I did not touch the June purchase, so that there is not applicable to my calculation Yeah. So the answer I wanted you to work out is to say, okay, so of the 440, 300 is left over from the 30th of November purchase, and 140 is left over from the 30th of September purchase. That is how you work out FIFO. Now, the rest can become a bit more complicated, okay, because now we've got carriage-on purchases. So, I'm not going to do the calculation with you. You are going to do the calculation. Remember, we add the carriage to our purchase price. That is part of the periodic inventory system is that we are going to add that closing stock, sorry, that to our closing stock value. So our actual closing stock is 375 there per unit and 430 per unit. So based on what you have here, 30 at 430, so I'm going to times that by 430, sorry, 300, my apologies, 300 times 430 and 140 times 375. So can you do that quickly on your answer sheets? I will do it on my answer sheet as well and then we will look at the answer together. Okay, so there's the answer, 300 units times 430. Remember, I added my carriage-on purchases there, 140 units times 375. I added my carriage-on purchase per unit there, and I get a total of 181,500 rand. I want to give you want you to give yourselves a pat on the back if you've got that. Just two difficulties that I would foresee learners not necessarily knowing how to work up. Okay, remember you spot your last and you work backwards. Just a reminder, you absorb that into that, and 440 can't go into 300, so you must move up. Okay.
Just remember that. Another point to remember is I add my carriage-on purchases to my unit price to work out my closing stock because that's the actual value of my closing stock. Right. Teachers, are there any questions? Mrs. Conradi, are there any questions on the chat? If no. There's there, no there are no questions in the okay. chat at this stage. Okay. Learners, I know that FIFO is the one that you that you understand the best. Okay. And you really can, that was a six mark question. So that's six marks towards your exam. Now I do again. Okay, and I'm going to do the calculation for cost of sales and then I'm going to do the calculation for gross profit and that is the next question. So let's go back to the PowerPoint and when I'm done with that, then that is FIFO. That is FIFO answering the three questions. And right, so... First question, calculate the value of closing stock, and that is what we just did when we calculated the 181,500 on your activity, okay? Cost of sales. There's a formula that you are going to use. Please stick to this formula. You use it whether you're using FIFO or whether you're using weighted average. It doesn't matter which method you are using, you calculate cost of sales in the same way. When it's perpetual, you obviously calculate cost of sales using your profit markup. But in most cases, they ask you to calculate cost of sales using the periodic inventory system. This is how you calculate cost of sales. You take, so your formula is opening stock plus net purchases. Now, net purchases is purchases minus returns. Okay, so that's your net purchases. Then you're going to plus your carriage on purchases or custom duty or both, if there is, minus your closing stock. And that equals your cost of sales. So please write that down somewhere. I know that Mrs. Conradi also gave it to you in the worksheet, how to calculate cost of sales. You can calculate it like that, or you can calculate it in a sum. Okay. It doesn't matter. But don't waste time writing down the word opening stock, net purchases, because remember, you need to get through your exam as quickly as possible. But this is basically opening stock plus purchases. Here I've broken up. I've got, here I've got net purchases in my table, which is purchases minus returns. In my calculation at the bottom, I've got opening stock plus purchases minus returns minus closing stock okay and that gives me my cost of sales so that is how we are going to calculate cost of sales using this formula and i'm going to do it in the sum at the bottom but if this is how you remember it and if you're comfortable with that then you can but please don't draw the table and the lines okay because then you're just wasting time in your exam so that's how to calculate cost of sales how do we calculate gross profit? We simply say sales minus cost of sales, and that gives us our gross profit. So write down, let me give you some time just to write down this formula quickly. Write down the one at the bottom, which is opening stock plus purchases minus returns minus closing stock. Okay, I just want to also mention something. My purchases will include my carriage, but when we get to the activity, I will show you that. Okay, so there's your formula for calculating cost of sales. There's your formula for calculating gross profit. Sales minus cost of sales. And you use the same calculation as what you did in the previous um, sum. Okay, so... In my previous sum, I got 21500 for cost of sales, so I bring that amount down because that is the marks that you get for work with marks. Okay, 
So you do, you do, right? There we go. I just want to point out, don't forget your opening stock there. That is your inventory. Is another word for inventory is a stock. So that on the 1st of Jan, that is your opening stock value there, right? Then when it comes to purchases, learners, please don't forget to include your carriage on purchases. So total purchases is that plus carriage on purchases. Remember when I showed the column, the column said opening stock plus purchases plus carriage on purchases. Okay, so you can either say opening stock plus purchases plus carriage on purchases, but because that total is given, you can use that total, which includes carriage on purchases. Now, don't forget your returns. You must minus your returns, and there is no refund for carriage. So please don't go and work out any carriage on that. There's generally no refund for carriage, okay? And then you can calculate your cost of sales. Once you have your cost of sales, there's your sales amount. Sales minus cost of sales gives you gross profit. You have five minutes to do that. Five minutes to do that calculation. Miss Moyes? Yes? One of the learners would like mm -hmm. to see the opening stock amount again, okay, please. Sure. So there's the opening stock amount on your previous page. They always seem to give you opening stock and closing stock together. So you must just be aware of the dates.
Okay, now remember I said we do, so it doesn't mean that I do alone, you do as well. So I'm going to ask um, a learner from, let's say, Elsie's River High School and a learner from Fairdale High School. The learner from Elsie's River High School, if you can give us the answer for cost of sales, please, you can type it in. You can ask your teacher to type it in and Ma'am Conradi will, will check it. And um, the learner from Fairdale High School, if you can type in the gross profit amount into the chat, please. You can all confirm the, uh, that that is correct. Or are you all just too shy to do that? If you're too shy to do that, that's fine. No problem. Okay, so. Let me go back now. We mark. Okay, let's mark the work. So there's the answer. And you can see that I did it in a sum. There's my opening stock rand value. There's my purchases rand value. There's my carriage on purchases rand value. I decided to put it separately, but you can put it together. There's no problem. It's just sometimes when they give you the amount separately, then you know you must add the two. There's my returns and there's my closing stock rand value. Now, can you see that I've got my closing stock from the previous calculation? Okay, you have to do that. Even if you're not sure about that amount, please copy over that answer there so that you get a work with mark, right? So now you get... 887,100, that is your cost of sales. Now to work out gross profit, you take sales minus cost of sales, and you can see that I copied over that cost of sales here. Okay, that's also another work with Mark to get 492,900. So all you need to remember, and I'm gonna say this for the last time now learners, when you're working out value of closing stock, you're using a method. When you're using cost of sale or when you're calculating cost of sales and gross profit, you use the same calculation. So you don't get confused. So then you only need to study your three methods and know that there's a differentiation in your three methods. Okay. I am Ma'am Conradi. Do you think I should give the learners a slight break? Then we're going to move over to weighted average. And then we are going to move over. After that, we're going to move over to specific identification. It's we already can, an hour. Yeah, we can do that, man. And in the meantime, if anybody has questions, they must please put it in the chat. They yes. send they send me the answers. Um, oh. but I would like them to put it on the chat. Please. Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you so much for sending the answers. And please, yes, any questions? Because now we're going to move on to weighted average. And um, we can, fortunately, we're going to use the same activity for weighted average. So I'm going to give you a short break, learners. We've been busy for an hour now. And before I move on, any, any questions, please don't be afraid to ask. No problem. Thank you.
be that tedious and it's not going to be that overwhelming. So let's continue with weighted average. And I'm so pleased to know that some schools have worked ahead of time with the with their calculations, I really am pleased to know. So weighted average is a formula. Okay, so you just apply the formula to the question that is given, to the schedule that you are given. There I have on the screen, I have the same schedule as what I had when we did FIFO, the same explanation, the same number of units left, the same number of units bought, the same rand value. But you're going to see that the weighted average is going to give us a different closing stock, a different cost of sales and a different gross profit. Okay, because now we are averaging all the, the rand values together and we're not separating them as per the original units purchased. So let's look at the weighted average. Remember the first thing I said, we need to know how many units are left over. And according to the schedule, there are 13 units left over. When you look at weighted average, the formula is basically total value, which is your value column over your number of units. So your numerator, your um, rand value on top is your value, your rand, and your denominator, the bottom amount is your number of units. How do we work out the total RAND value? We take the opening stock RAND value plus purchases minus returns plus carriage on purchases or custom duty. Okay, so we're basically taking the first few lines of our calculation for um, cost of sales, which is opening stock plus purchases plus carriage on purchases, minus returns. And at the bottom, it is units of opening stock, units of purchases, and units of returns. You can see that there's no carriage on purchases or custom duty in your denominator, your bottom amount, because it is not RAND value, okay? And you don't have units for carriage on purchases, and you don't have units for custom duty. It is only the RAND value that you consider. So how do we calculate it then? We take, if you look at our information here, I'm taking my RAND value, my 16, my 6,000 plus my 37,500 plus my, sorry, minus my 2,500. Okay, that is my numerator. There I've got my opening stock RAND value, my purchases RAND value, and my returns RAND value. There was no carriage on purchases in this activity. At the bottom, I have my units that I had at the beginning of the year. I have my total units purchased minus my total returns. Then it gives me a value. Now, that is not my closing stock. That is just the weighted average. Okay, it is my weighted average. That RAND value, 1,483 is my weighted average. That is my closing stock, 19,290, because now I take my 13, my number of units left over, and times that by my um, weighted average. And then I get my closing stock. If I look at my cost of sales calculation, it's still opening stock plus purchases, plus carriage on purchases, minus returns, okay? And then there are minus my closing stock. And you can see that the values change. If I look at my gross profit calculation, it is still sales minus cost of sales. And there, the only difference is that my values changed. So learners, once you understand how to calculate your formula, then you can't go wrong. So let's look at my Next question. Now they are asking me, we're still busy with question one. Now they are asking me, they say, the owner considers changing the stock valuation method. Okay. Calculate the value of closing stock using the weighted average method. So now we are going to apply a formula. Okay. 
I'm going to write the formula down for you so that you don't forget. It is numerator denominator. Okay, so my numerator is opening stock plus purchases plus carriage on purchases if there is, and in the activity there is, minus returns. Okay, that is the RAND value. At the bottom, I have opening stock plus purchases minus returns units. Okay, so can you do this calculation? Please remember there is 440 units left over. So at the end, I'm going to take my answer that I get here and times by 440. Okay. So if you can do that calculation, I'm going to, there's my opening stock value. Don't forget that. That's my opening stock value. And I'm going to turn the page over now. So that's the first thing you write down. Okay. Turning the page over. Now, please do the rest. You do. Same information, different method. Same information, different method. Just calculate the weighted average or the value of closing stock using the weighted average. Average. That's all I would like you to calculate. Ms. Moyes? Yes? Um, a request to please go back to the formula, please. Okay. Thank you. Is this fine if I put the formula like this? Opening stock plus purchases plus carriage on purchases minus returns. That's RAND value and that's units opening stock plus purchases minus returns. Learners, also please note that you don't have to write this down in an exam. You simply go to the amounts and the RAND value. Okay, so don't waste time by writing this down, but it is important for you to know this. So if you're writing it down so that you can study this formula, then please go ahead and do so. I'm going to give you one more minute. So it's you do now and then we will do it.
Miss Moes. Yes. Um, a request from a learner to go to the next page, please. And then Sinan Jongo already placed the answer yes, in the chat. I already placed. Okay, yes. I was going to ask them now, ma'am. Thank you. So I said that I, I like it when schools work ahead and Sinan Jongo has worked ahead. So Sinan Jongo, can you give me the answer, please? Is in this chat here, ma'am? Can I go back to the chat? Yeah. Um, if you would like me to read it to you, it's fine yes, because please. Masiban Bisani and Thin Jongo actually gave uh, the answers. Okay. And so I'm just going to read it. It's 171,600. Yes. That is and the right answer. 171,600. Yes. We are getting more answers on. So thank wow. you so much for the participation there. And the answers are all correct, ma'am? They all have 171,000. Wow, that's awesome. That is awesome. Wonderful. That is wonderful. Learners, if you are getting this right, and it's generally this um, question that learners struggle with, then I'm really, really so proud of you. Really, really, I am. So let's just go through it quickly. Our numerator, the top line is value. Okay, so it's the value of my opening stock, 181,000, plus the value of my purchases. Okay, there's total purchases, so it's the value of my purchases. So it's that one there, plus the value of my carriage on purchases, minus the value of my returns. So that's all RAND value. Then... When, my, when I get to my denominator, I take number of. So now I go to my number of units. 540 is what I started out with. Then I bought a, an additional 2250. There's my number. And I returned 50. Okay. So there's the answer. And you can see the block is so small and I write so big. So you do have those fancy calculators that you can actually do the calculation like this. You put that on top and then you divide it by that. And your unit price, your unit weighted average. Remember that's your unit weighted average. You bought your items. Let me just go back to that quickly just to explain weighted average. Yeah, I bought my items at different prices. At 370, at 380, at 350, at 400, and so forth. But my weighted average, when I did my calculation and I applied my formula, I got a weighted average of 390. Now that I must times by the number of units left over, the number of um, units of closing stock. And that is my RAND value of my closing stock. A lot of learners stop there, but that's not the answer. You must times it by your closing stock units to get your RAND value closing stock. So that answer is closing stock. Now let's just look at the closing stock and I'm hoping that I'll be able to see both. Yes, I can. Let's just look at, because that's the next question. When I did FIFO, so that's FIFO closing stock, Okay, FIFO closing stock there, and that is weighted average closing stock. So my closing stock there is 181,000. So in my balance sheet or in my statement of financial position, I'm going to disclose that I have stock on hand or closing stock 181,500 if I apply FIFO. However, if I apply weighted average, my value in my balance sheet is almost, um, let me see, 10,000 less. I'm saying that I have, it's the same stock. It's the same items bought for the same price on the same date, but I'm disclosing a lower value. Now, the question here is, what will the effect be on the gross profit, okay, if the owner changes to this valuation method. So now you have to go and look at how that will affect the gross profit. If my closing stock is less, okay, by about 9,000 something, 
my cost of sales is going to be more. And I've got a slide that I'm going to show you later on. Therefore, my gross profit is going to be less. So that is the type of thinking that you have to apply here. Okay, and I'm going to go into that slide so that we can answer this question later on. I don't want to focus on this question later now, but I want you just to look at the difference. Can you see applying a different method gives me a different result? Okay, and that is just where I want you to park that one for now. Can we go to activity... Let me just see here. Because I want you to practice the stock methods before we move on to the next one. Because we don't have a lot of time left. So I just want to spend 15 more minutes on calculating the value of closing stock for cabinets using the first in, first out method. Now we're going to 2.1 quickly. And then I will come back to all those other smaller questions. And we must still do specific identification, which will not take us that long. Okay, so first in, first out, let's just practice that so that I can see that you've got that one right. Using first in, first out. So go to 2.1 quickly. Okay, and here we have the schedule. There we have the schedule. So just go to that page and your answer sheet. I know we're jumping around, but I would rather just do a quick calculation on first in, first out again. And we are doing the first in, first out method for the cabinets. Okay, please note learners, you have to make markings on your question paper so you don't use the wrong information. They want first in, first out for cabinets. Look at the information. I'm going to give you five minutes to do that. I only want the value of closing stock for cabinets using the first in, first out. If five minutes is too little, please indicate that you need a bit more time. But I just want you to do 2.1 for six marks. Now you do. And once you have the answer, please put the answer on the chat. Put up your hand and then go and give the answer to your teacher.
Ma'am Conrani, if you can uh, indicate whether the learners are responding with the answers. Um, yes, we do have some answers. Some have actually posted the answers for 1.2.3 as well. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, and then we have an answer for 2.1 from Sinan Jongo, and the other question that was answered was from Masi Bambisani as well. Wow. So, we do get some feedback from the learners. Lovely. So I'm going to show the answer. If you don't have that answer, it's fine. I'm going to explain now where I got these values from. These are the most important values here and how I got that breakdown to 30 and 50. Okay, then I times that by the respective cost price and then I added the two together to get 302,500. That is the correct answer. Now, you have to be aware of, remember I said to you, the first thing you look for is number of units that I have left over, 280. So how is that 280 shared? Okay, because if I look at my last purchase, it is 250. But don't be caught because here they say returns. Now, in this case, they don't say when that return was from, but you can see the cost price is the same as the last purchase. So the return of 20 there was from that last purchase in July. So my July amount available was only 230. And that's where I get the 230 from because that purchase cancels out that 250 to make it 230 because that's the same. So often they don't say 20 was returned from July purchase, but you have to look at the cost price. Okay. Now I can't 280 can't go into 230. Remember the bucket I spoke about? That bucket is now overflowing. So it's going to spill up and there has to be 50 left of the 1,200 because that must add to 280. Okay, so you simply say 280 minus 230, that gives me 50. So there has to be 50 left of that purchase, which was 990. So it's 50 at 990, 230 at 1,100. And there you have your answer. And a lot of learners struggle with that. You just have to always look for two things. Number one, what is the number of units I have left over? I have 280 left over. What was my last purchase? If my last purchase is less, then I must flow upwards, okay? Because my bucket is going to overflow. And there you have FIFO. If they were to ask you to calculate cost of sales, you know how to do that. If they were to ask you to calculate gross profit, you know how to do that. Just apply your formulas. The last one that I'm going to do with you learners, let me leave that on there. The last one, and then we're going to go to all those smaller questions that often learners struggle with, is the, where is it now, specific identification, 2.5. Okay, 2.5. We're not going to do this one now for now. 2.5, we're going to look at that there. Calculate the value of closing stock. There it is again, using the specific identification method. That's all they're asking for, okay? And it's on the next page. That's cabinets and lamps. And there you have your television sets. Okay, so there we go. All part of one question, there's your television sets. I'm not going to do this one with you. This is going to be you do. So let me do the I do quickly. And then we are going to go to the smaller questions. So specific identification is just that. Okay. You look at 
Sorry, let me just go through that quickly. Go back there. There we go. Specific identification. The cost price is assigned to the specific item. So now there's no FIFO. There's no weighted average. If you bought that car, if you bought five cars, let's say, for a certain price and you have two left over, you have two cars at that price. And here's the example. The example here is of BMW cars, okay? Two things you must look at is the number of units purchased or available, okay? I have 10, 15, 12 available, number of units sold. What I have available minus what I sold is what is left over. So, if I had 10 units of the BMW 3 Series and I sold 10, then I've got nothing left. Okay, then I've got no more BMW 3 Series left over. If I bought 15 of the BMW 4 Series and I sold 8, then I have 7 left because... 15 minus 8 is 7. Therefore, 7 is on hand. 7 is left over. And then I take the 7 times the 480,000. 7 that I have left over times the 480,000, which is my unit price. If I had 12 or if I bought 12 and I sold 5, but I mustn't forget I returned two of the BMW 5 Series. Can you see at the bottom there by returns? BMW 5 Series, I returned two. So in effect, I only had 10 available. I sold five, so therefore I have five left over. Then I take the five times the 620. So how do I work that out? I don't have any more three series of the Four series, I had seven left at 480. So it's what I had available minus what I sold. Don't forget that. So I times it by the unit price. And my BMW 5 series, I have five left because I bought 12. I sold a two, but I returned two. Therefore, I had five left at 620. So that is how you work out your specific identification. It has become a lot more popular to ask that question. A lot, a lot more popular. So let's look at that. What do you look out for? Without me giving you the answer, what do you look out for? If you look at that bit, the televisions, I look at my models. There I look at my models. Okay, so you have to be aware of your models. There you have to be aware of your sales. So your purchases minus your sales is going to give you what you have left over, which is also known as closing stock, your units. Then you take your units that you have left over times it by your unit price. Please, not your selling price, your unit cost price. Okay, so if you can do that, look at your LYNs, how many you have, how many you sold, how many you have left over. Okay, your KYA, how many you have, how many you sold, how many you have left over, times it by the unit price, and then give me the answer. You have three minutes. Let me give you three minutes rather because you guys are working very fast. If you don't understand, please put it on the chat. I will explain it again. This is just a different layout. So you must look at your different so you take that unit minus that unit. Okay, you can't add them all together. That unit minus that unit there. You have to look at them separately. Specific identification. Specific identification.
If you have the answer, you can submit the answer to Ma'am Conradi. We do have an answer from Sin and Jongo. I'm going to allow the others to also put okay. the answers on the chat as well. Okay. Well done, Sin and Jongo. We also have answers from um, Inquin Quezi. So well done to those two well schools done. for posting the well answers. Done. Well done. Should I give the learners some more time, ma'am? Eh? Or should we just reinforce and, and mark the work? I think we can just reinforce. Okay. We are getting answers through from the other schools, okay. from Uden as well. So I think they're on par. Okay. So learners, if you understand that, so, what I've found with this is the layout is vastly different for different activities. All you need to remember is I need to look at my diff, my I need to look at my specific units. When I'm working out a calculation, I only look at a particular item, whether it's a TV, whether it's a car, whatever that is, and I look at the number of units that I have available or that I purchased minus the units that I sold to work out what I have left over and take what I have left over times my unit price. That is all you have to do, no matter how the information is presented to you. That is what you do. So this is not my best work because I made a mistake there. I apologize. So the information or the column was also very small to do the working out. So I took my two amounts that I had available minus what I sold to get 870. 870 I took times 6,000. Yeah, I did the same. My two units that I, the items that I had available minus what I sold to get nine, 10 times 7,200. And I got 11,772,000. ,000. So that is how I worked that out. There are many ways to work it out, but I find that this is the quickest way to work it out is simply to have stock that you have left over times the unit price. That is the quickest way. And that is seven marks. So we have about a half an hour. I can't believe that time has flown so, so quickly. And I really hope that you have enjoyed the session. I'm not finishing off. I now want to touch on the little bits of questions that they ask that make up all the marks for the section. Obviously, the bulk of the mark is um, your calculations, okay? And then you need to understand this work as well. So I just want to go to this last slide this very last slide that I said that I prepared for you, okay, with regards to, not that one, here we go. I have two valuation methods on the, on the board in front of you, and the one, it, it was exactly the same information. Remember the one with the bicycles? Um, the same number of units purchased, the same number of units sold, the same number of units left over. Ms. Moyes, I, I do apologize, but yes. there's a hand from Sin and Jongo. Yes. They can go ahead to ask a question. Yes, they can, ma'am. Sin and Jongo, there's a hand up. You may ask your question. Hi, ma'am. Um, do you mind re explaining the specific identification method for my other group? Thank you. For, oh, must I just go over it again? Yes, please. That'll be perfect. Must I go over the answer? Or do you want me to Not go over the, the, the method, the method. So this one here? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, should I go to the PowerPoint? Which one was a bit more clear? I think the television sets, that's what you can use. Okay. So... Learners, what you need to look at is your specific 
item. Okay, so here's the television sets. The one model is called the LYN and the other model is called the KYA. So what we look at is how many units I purchased or I had available, okay, because they can also include opening stock there. So you look at how many units you had available for that particular item, specific item. Then you minus what you sold because you want to work out what you had left over because remember you're working out the value of closing stock so this is the units left over so you take the units purchased you take the units sold to get the number of units left over once you have that units left over you times it by the cost price or the unit price of that item. Let me just do that. Unit price of that item to get your closing stock for that item. Okay? So you're going to get closing stock for the LYN. And you're going to do the same with the KYA. Then you're going to say 950 KYA plus 500 minus my 540, what I sold. So I have left over 910 units. That I'm going to times with my 720, not my selling price, my cost price. So it's my unit cost price to get my closing stock for my KYA. And that is what I did here. Okay, I took what I purchased minus what I sold, to get my units left over times my unit cost price. What I purchased minus what I sold to get my units left over times my unit price. I added the two together to get my total closing stock for all my television sets. Is that fine, ma'am? Thank you so much, ma'am. It made more sense. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I'm just going to go back to the PowerPoint. There we go. Oops. I think it's that one there. Yes. So now we look at the commenting of, of this work or the understanding. Because the question will be, um, the owner wants to change from FIFO to weighted average. Or the owner wants to change from weighted average to FIFO. What would your advice be? So this table that I drew up here kind of gives you the understanding of what the outcome is of the different methods. And I can, the, my question here is which valuation method is better? And I'm going to conclude by saying neither is better. Both have their advantages and their disadvantages. But when a business owner decides on a method, it is best that they stick to that method. The method is also determined by what they sell. So it will not make sense if a business selling cars is going to use the weighted average. So it also depends on what they sell. But let's look at the outcome. Here I have exactly the same business, exactly the same everything, opening stock, purchases, closing stock, number of units. But depending on the method that they are using, they're going to get a different closing stock outcome. So if you use FIFO, your closing stock value is going to be higher than if you use weighted average. That's just always the outcome, okay? Your closing stock value is going to be higher than if you use weighted average. Now, why is closing stock important? Because closing stock is a disclosure item in your balance sheet. So, closing stock in the financial, in the statement of financial position will affect the net asset value your current and asset test ratios, and your stock indicators, your stock turnover and those sorts of indicators. So if we're talking about 19,500,000 and 19,200,000, then the variation seems a lot bigger from a disclosure point of view. So all you have to know, learners, is that when you Use FIFO, your closing stock value in your balance sheet, your trading stock value in your balance sheet is going to be higher. 
So it's going to seem like it's a lot more favorable that you have a higher net asset value. So your company is going to look a lot more attractive to investors. However, okay, so that's an advantage for FIFO. When you look at your calculation for cost of sales, your cost of sales value is going to be lower when you do your calculation for cost of sales. When you use FIFO, if you use weighted average, your cost of sales value is going to be higher. Now, a low cost of sales value is going to give you a high gross profit. A high cost of sales value is going to give you a low, low gross profit because it, those are income statement information and um, cost of sales has a direct impact on your gross profit. So when you look at gross profit, it affects your income tax and your profitability disclosure. Now, if the company goes for FIFO, it looks like they're making more profit, but they have to pay more tax. Because if you earn more profit, you have to pay more tax. Okay, because gross profit, you don't pay tax on gross profit, but obviously a higher gross profit is going to end up being a higher net profit. If the same company uses weighted average, they're going to disclose a lower gross profit and a lower net profit. Therefore, they have a lower tax obligation. So can you see that neither um, method is going to be an absolute better or an absolute worse? The bottom line is when a de owner decides on a method, they have to stick to that method. These figures are only for disclosure purposes, okay? It doesn't affect your rands and cents because you actually still paid that money for that stock. So it's not going to have a bearing on your bank balance. It's only going to have a bearing on your financial statement figures. So when I say which valuation method is better, I would say neither is better. Both have their advantages and both have their disadvantages. And this feeds into the question that they asked in number one. Okay, that feeds into that question. What will the effect on, on the gross profit be? In other words, they're asking here, if the owner changes to a different method, okay, what will the effect be on the gross profit if you're using your weighted average method. So if you look at this here, if you look at this argument here, what will the effect be? If we use FIFO, we have a higher weighted average, a wire, sorry, a higher gross profit. If we use weighted average, we will end up with a lower gross profit. And like I showed you, I just want to show you this quickly. Like I showed you here, your closing stock difference, let's make it smaller. Okay, your closing stock difference is about 9,000. Okay, so therefore your gross profit using weighted average is going to be 9,000 Rand less. Okay. That is going to be the effect on the gross profit. I'm hoping that you'll be able to see that based on the information. So it says the gross profit will decrease by 9,900, which is the difference between that and that, because according to this, my gross profit using weighted average is going to be less because my closing stock using weighted average was less. Okay, my closing stock using weighted average was less. So that you can do your calculation, but it's going to waste a lot of time by calculating cost of sales and then calculating gross profit. But you must just know that if closing stock is less, cost of sales will be more, therefore gross profit will be less. So that is that answer there. The answer is my gross profit is going to decrease by 
And the answer here is the difference between the 8,000, 800, sorry, 181,500 and that amount there, 9,900. That is important to know. Okay. Let's just do this one here. 1.1. Merchandise purchased, I'm not going to give you the answer, we are doing now, okay? Merchandise purchased is recorded as an asset or an expense to the business using the perpetual that I had in my slide. Perpetual is what you always were aware of. The question is, do I use, when I use perpetual, do I use my trading stock account or do I use my purchases account? If you use trading stock, it's an asset. If you use purchases, it's an expense. Now you need to ask yourself, which do I use? And the answer is, if you can type it in. I will circle the answer. I'm using perpetual. Do I, use, do I have a, a trading stock account in perpetual? Do I have a purchase? Have you, have you ever seen a purchases account? In grade eight and grade nine? No. So therefore my answer is asset. Okay, my answer there is asset. Next one. The specific identification or weighted average stock valuation method is best suited for unique high value product. Remember, what did we do when we did <coughs> when we did that one? We did cars, we did television sets. When we did that one, we did baked beans. So which one do you think it is? Miss Moise, yes. uh, sorry to interrupt. Pedal has a question. Yes. Pedal, you can go ahead. Pedal, your hand is up. Please ask your question. Okay, I think you may continue. I don't okay. think that was there. Yeah. Okay, thank you, ma'am. So by now you must have the answer. Can anyone type in the answer, please? Okay, I'm going to guess for you. Specific identification. Can I just add something? Don't leave these questions out. At school level, there's no negative marking. So even if you get the answer wrong, you simply get it wrong. There's no minus one. Please don't leave out multiple choice. Please don't leave out match the word. Please don't leave out match the column. Okay, you answer these questions because there's a 50% chance that you can get it right and a 50% chance that you can get it wrong. So this answer is the specific identification stock valuation method is best suited for high value products. Okay. And in the last one, cost of sales is usually calculated at the end of the financial year, at the end of the financial year in the periodic or perpetual um, remember, with perpetual, I'm, I'm going to tell you what you know. With perpetual, you had an updated cost of sales all the time. Perpetual all the time. Okay? So, your answer would then be? Um, Sina Jongo has the answer already, if yes. you don't mind giving it. Uh, it says periodic. and there we Masi, go. Masi yes. Bambisane has a hand up. So, okay. we'll just so it check if it is a question. It is periodic. Masiba Misane, you may go ahead if you have a question. Okay, I think that's Hi. also by Ms. Yes. May we ask why did, why would the gross profit decrease on number okay. 1.2? Okay, okay, let me explain. So, uh, that's one here. Should I go to the activity rather? Not. Oh, all right. 
why will the gross profit decrease? If you look at, now the only way to prove that, remember when you have, I'm gonna use it here. Okay, ma'am, thank you. If you take this calculation to work out cost of sales, okay, so you first have to work out cost of sales to work out gross profit. If I put in that amount, closing stock, I'm going to put in a lower closing stock here, right? So instead of the 181,500, I'm taking away 171,600. That's if I use the weighted average, which means that my cost of sales is going to be more because I'm taking away less there. So my cost of sales is going to be more. And if you do the calculation, if you say that plus that plus that minus that minus that amount, which is less, I'm going to get a higher cost of sales. And because I'm getting a higher cost of sales, I'm taking away more from my sales. I'm getting a lower gross profit. So if you want to do that sum to work it out, it's going to take you very long because this is only three marks, so it's going to waste time. You just have to know that if you have a higher closing stock, you're going to have a, sorry, if you have a lower closing stock here, you're going to have a lower gross profit. I'm hoping that I explained it, ma'am. Please just confirm. Because I'm taking away less here. In terms of my closing stock, I end up with a higher cost of sales. Because I end up with a higher cost of sales there, I end up with a lower gross profit. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you. So it's, it's this table here, ma'am, that the learners have to understand to be able to make a very quick comment. Otherwise, they can calculate, but my fear is that it takes so much time and it's only for three marks. So my suggestion would be for them to understand this table and the effect that it has on our financial statements. And I'm really enjoying the questions that's coming because I don't know what the questions are, so I just carry on um, not knowing what the questions are. So if there's more questions, please ask now. Otherwise, I'm going to go on to the next question, which is this one here for nine marks. So if you would like me to go on with this question for nine marks, where internal control is concerned, I do see a lot of these questions popping up in the exam. They are the more challenging questions to answer, but if the learners have an idea of what is being asked, they will be able to answer the questions. So if we look at internal control of stock, what are the biggest problems where stock is concerned? One of the biggest problems where stock is concerned, and we saw it in our country now, is theft. Okay, vandalism, we can add to that as well. Yes, stock can go missing. Stock can be vandalized. Stock can be sold. St <laughs> stolen, sorry. Okay. What else can happen um, to, the, to, the, to the stock? Theft is not the only one. What about incorrect um, recording? That is also a problem. Or incorrect stock taking. That is also a problem with regards to, to stock. Um, what about creditors' prices increasing? These are things that we don't necessarily have control over. This one here, we do have control over these things there. So this is what you need to bear in mind when you look at a question like this with regards to internal control of stock. One of the things when we give advice, okay, so these are the problems. When we give advice, we can talk about division of labor. So a lot of learners get it wrong. They give advice where they must state the problem, and they state the problem when they must give advice. 
So advice would be division of labor, okay? Or separation of duties. That's the same thing. So that's the advice that you would give. So please be aware of the difference between the problem and advice. So we only have three minutes left, learners. So let's just look at this here. It says, the only is concerned that the figures provide a poor, um, reflect poor, poor internal control and decision making. Identify one problem for each product, only one problem for each product, and in each case, suggest how to solve the problem. So you have to look at tables, chairs, and beds separately. Okay, you don't compare tables to chairs to beds. So if you look at tables, I started out with 50 tables. I bought 670 tables. I sold 600 tables. My physical count says that I have 90 left over. So what I would do is I would actually do a calculation. 50 plus 670 gives me 730, 720, sorry. 720 minus 600, that should have been 120, but it's only 90. So if I do a sum there, my answer should be 120 there. But I only my physical count says there's only 90. So there was theft or missing tables. Okay, so there my problem is stock went missing. So those are the things you have to look at. Try and figure out what they are trying to say. They, they must be a problem. The fact that they are giving this to you, the, the, you have to figure out what the problem is. And that one there is missing stock. 30 items went missing. Learners, when they say quote figures, okay, please quote figures. So now you'll say 30 items went missing. That's a figure. But they say called figures. Now, 30 times 1,500. Now you can say there's a loss or a loss of 45,000. So you must try and figure out what figures you must use. And ma'am, Conradi, it is one o'clock. So as much as I would like to go on, if you would allow me to, I don't know what the feeling is on the ground at the schools. If the learners must leave now, but... I'm afraid I'm going to have to end. Um, Ms. Moyes, I yes. do. They, I know there's a request that says continue, okay. uh, but we need to, um, as soon as the e-learning advises us to switch off, we need to go because I think they work according to a schedule as well. Okay. So I'll check Learn with them as well. Okay. Learners, what I do know is that your teachers will get the answer books, so you can work through these questions with your teachers. What I can say to you is don't look at this at face value, okay? Please look at this with an open mind and say, there's a problem. Let me find the problem. This is nine marks. Don't throw away nine marks because you look at it and you say, I can't. Look at the problem and see what is the problem here, okay? You look at that and you see, okay, right? There is 199, but let me times it by whatever to see what the problem is. Um, and I'm, I'm waiting for Ma'am Conradi to let me know if I must stop or, or continue. Okay, so I started with 209. I purchased that and I sold that amount. So now in my calculator, I must do 209 plus that. And let me just do that calculation with you. Yes, if you look at it, you can see that there's money missing, okay? There should be more money. If I look at what I sold, my selling price times, sorry, the unit sold times my selling price, it does not equal to 1,800,000. It should have equaled to, on my calculator, 1,920,000. So, money went missing here. Now, it's not a stock problem, but it could be incorrect recording. Okay, they couldn't have recorded the information correctly. Maybe they, inc they incorrectly 
into the selling price that was a wrong selling price or somehow money went missing so what is my um advice here definitely division of duties okay proper documentation when i record my stuff proper documentation and so forth so you have to look at this with an open mind if you look at the beds I started out with 300, I purchased 380, I sold 480, okay? So, I have 200 left, that looks correct, that should be 680, that is correct, so there's no problem there. So, now I'm trying to find the problem. My selling price is 3,000. If I look at, I had 680, I only sold 480. I've got this one of it's the highest stock value. Okay, the, the rand value is the highest, and I have a lot of beds left over. I have too much stock on hand. I should have bought less beds. Look at that there. I should have bought less beds because having 200 beds. Where am I going to store the beds? So the storage becomes a problem. So my advice there is buy less beds. Okay. I bought far too much beds. I sold too little beds. Maybe market the beds differently. So these questions are quite challenging. But you have to look at it with an open mind. You have to go into the exam knowing what your internal controls are. You have to know what the problems are and how to fix those problems. So, learners, there's a lot of studying involved in accounting as well. You have to go and study certain things. My advice, study your formulas, okay? Always know your formats of your financial statements. But I will talk about that on Friday. I will see you on Friday. I'm looking forward to Friday. On Friday, we are going to be doing... Um, now, what are we going to be doing on Friday? Why can't I remember, Mrs. Konradi? Manufacturing. There we go, manufacturing. I think my brain is just a bit tired. We are going to be doing manufacturing on Friday. And manufacturing is another section of the work that you can score your marks in. So now, my advice, go and practice this. Ask your teacher for the answers. And then I'll see you on Friday. I know I went over time. I will try not to go over time on Friday. Thank you so much, Mrs. Conradi. Thank you so much, learners. I really appreciate this, and I really enjoyed the session. Um, just before we go, we have one hand up, so I think one yes. of the learners would like to ask a question. Yes. Lisa, okay. you can continue. Lisa Kanya, if you want to... Bye.